<laughs> thanks very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thanks for the introduction. So I'm here to talk about blockchain, Bitcoin, cryptocurrency. It's, it's a big topic. Um, so I guess the place to start is to figure out what blockchain is to begin with. And that's not going to help us. There we are. Okay. So blockchain is really very simple. It's a ledger. A ledger is just a thing you write things down in. So I like to picture Scrooge McDuck sitting on a pile of gold with a ledger in front of him, and he writes down that John has six gold coins. And that's a ledger. It's just a name and an amount. That's all. Blockchain is a ledger. Um, you write checks, you make debits, you get credits, but at the end, it's just a, a list of how much you have to have your account. So, a blockchain is really what we call a state transition machine. So you have a current state, which is the ledger state, and you have transitions, you have re uh, transactions requests. So you validate the transactions requests, you add them to the current ledger, and you get the new ledger state. Uh, and that's, uh, that's what blockchain is all about. So how does it work? Bitcoin, Ethereum, most blockchains uh, that are similar to this work by uh, users uh, making requests to anonymous nodes. A node is just a computer that's set up to run the protocols, validate the transactions, write the blockchain. Uh, they're anonymous, and that's important because if they're not anonymous, they can be forced by a court or a government or a criminal to do things which are not according to protocol. So part of the, uh, part of the strength of uh, Bitcoin or blockchain generally is that the validators are anonymous and are therefore not subject to judicial and other kinds of pressures. You send your, uh, your uh, transaction to a node. The node sends it on to the rest of the nodes in the network. Bitcoin has something on the scale of 32,000 no nodes, uh, Ethereum about 12,000 or so. Uh, these nodes pass the message on to each other through a peer-to-peer -peer network like Napster. All right, so this peer-to-peer -peer network uh, is sometimes called a gossip network. And the reason for that is that it means we don't have to have a central register or a central server. All we need to know is the name of a couple of nodes that are also in the system. So a transaction comes to me, I tell a couple of friends, that node tells a couple of friends, and eventually the transaction propagates the entire network. Uncensorable, okay, so that's the point. If there's a central server, it can be blocked. Uh, each node collects a group of transactions. In the case of Bitcoin, it's 1,000 to 2,000. Uh, each node checks that these are valid transactions, and in particular this means uh, does the user have enough in his account to meet, uh, meet the demands? Does he have enough uh, to, to cover the transaction? Has he tried to double spend? This is very important. So if I have 12 Bitcoins and I send six to you and eight to you, that's clearly not valid because I've exceeded my balance. So I have to make sure that I don't double spend any Bitcoins. And then finally, am I authorized to spend those coins at all? And there's a cryptographic way of signing your, your transaction so that we know that for sure uh, no one but you could have actually made the request. So that's a bit of cryptographic magic involving public and private key pairs. After that's done, this block is appended to the existing blockchain. Uh, the ledger state is updated and uh, the nodes start to work on a new block. So, oops, wrong way. Okay, so. This is what the blockchain actually looks like. We have a genesis block, which is where we start. It's the initial state of the blockchain. The first block is just a group of transactions that have been validated. And the key thing there, you notice there's a hash of the genesis block in the first block. Now, a hash is a kind of uh, cryptographic fingerprint. So it turns out that uh, that hash tells me for sure that, uh, that I saw that it was appended to the genesis block. Block two has a hash of block one, which includes the hash of the genesis block. Block n has a hash of block n minus one, which has a block of hash of block n minus two. The, problem with the, the point of a hash is that if I alter even a single piece of data in a data object and then take the hash, the hash is going to be totally different. It's going to be a random distribution uh, of a 256-bit uh, binary number. So 
we can tell for sure that you haven't altered this. And this is, uh, this is something that you should learn about, actually. There's really only two things you need to know for modern technologies like this, hashing and public-private key pairs. Really, everything else is based upon that. So that prevents, that's called recursive hashing. Uh, in computer science, it's called a Merkle tree. And what that does is make it impossible to change something in the history in the past without having to recalculate the hashes all the way to the present. And so that gives a degree of immutability given the uh, other aspects of uh, proof of work. Oops. Okay, look a squirrel. So this is very simple. I'm omitting lots of stuff. All right, so if you want to investigate stuff, here's some other stuff that's important, uh, but in the interest of time, I can't cover everything. So I'm going to move by that quickly. So what's new? If it's just a ledger, I mean, we already have ledgers. What's, what's important about it? Well, there are five things, uh, six things, I'm sorry. The first is the ledger is distributed. So there are 32,000 Bitcoin nodes, each of which keeps its own copy of the blockchain and its own copy of the ledger state. This means that it's difficult to censor, right? Because there's so many copies out there that are supposed to be identical that no government can come and shut down every single one of them. On the other hand, the government can simply take over Bank of America, or there can be a denial of service attack, right? So if we have a central point of failure, there's a vulnerability. Blockchain is a distributed ledger, and that reduces the vulnerability. Also, it's distributed to anonymous actors, which reduces it even further. The second is it's immutable. Bank America has a balance for me, but what if Bank America altered their database? Said, ah, you yeah, used to have 2,000, now you've only got 1,000. How can I prove that they've taken my money? You know, it's their database. Uh, there's no appeal. There's no way I can actually prove that they've done anything. Uh, with blockchain, cryptographic uh, techniques make it impossible to rewrite history, and that's the recursive hashing uh, uh, element, and also uh, something called proof of work, which makes it computationally impractical to rewrite history. It's too expensive, too many calculations have to be done. Proof of work is an interesting topic on its own, but I'm going to move by it. Finally, uh, third, it's append only. So these blocks are appended sequentially. We know that because of the hashing pattern, right? We can always tell that this block followed that because the hash of the previous block is in the next block. So distributed, immutable, append only. Timestamps, we know when these blocks were written. So that can be a literal timestamp done in certain ways, or it can simply be a sequential timestamp. This thing was done after that thing, and often that's enough, just knowing that things were done in a certain sequence. Uncensorable. There is no such thing as Bitcoin Inc. There's no place that I can go to shut down Bitcoin. If the government tomorrow wanted to shut down Bitcoin, it simply could not. SEC cannot regulate Bitcoin because there is nobody to regulate. Now, SEC can regulate interactions of Bitcoin with the financial sector. So if you try to get Bitcoin and make a transaction that puts dollars in your account, that interface is controlled by the government and the FCC. At SEC, Securities and Exchange Commission. So getting money in and out of blockchain, there's where the interface is, uh, is difficult, but within blockchain, there's nothing to censor, nothing to block, nothing to stop. Finally, anonymity. So different blockchains offer different degrees of an anonymity, but the general idea is that uh, you don't actually have a name. It's not 12 bitcoins belong to John. It's 12 bitcoins belong to this, this uh, public key address, which is a long string of numbers. So there's no way directly to connect me with this arbitrary set of numbers. It's just a set of numbers. And then these numbers move some of the, some of the bitcoins to its account to another account, with which is another arbitrary string of numbers. So it's not clear it goes from me to you. It goes from some account to some other account. Now, it's often called pseudo-anonymous pseudo because there are ways to extract some information, uh, but other blockchains have actually been even more anonymous. Okay. So why would you use a blockchain instead of ordinary databases? Well, uh, blockchains are ledgers. They don't have tables, metadata, relational structures. You can't do SQL queries on them. They're like a lobotomized uh, database, right? They're really stupid. There's, not, there's almost nothing in a ledger, so it's really, there's a lot of disadvantages, really, to using blockchain as opposed to a database, and that means there's many cases in which we really would want to use a database. So blockchain is by no means the solution to all of our futures. Some places it's, uh, it works and it's useful, other places it's not. Okay, 
validation through proof of work. This is the, uh, the original Nakamoto protocol that was invented by this guy who doesn't exist. Uh, it's expensive, it's complex, uh, it's sometimes not very secure. It costs something like, the estimate is it costs $3.2 billion worth of electricity in, to uh, validate the Bitcoin blockchain in 2017. So that's how much electricity was used up doing the hashing that's required for the proof of work. So if you care about the environment, maybe that's a problem, but it's also a cost. It's a real cost of resources. That's more electricity than Ireland used. So it means somebody can't heat their houses because it's being used to validate the blockchain. Okay, so uh, Bitcoin uh, writes one block every 10 minutes. It's restricted to a megabyte of data. Ethereum, the other major competitor, has similar limits. Uh, so this restricts the amount of data. It's hard to scale. We can only have a limited number of transactions per second, and those transactions are expensive to record. Uh, there are other things, proof of stakes, uh, directed acyclic graphs, other solutions. Uh, they have their own problems. So all those things say blockchain is terrible. Why would we use it? Okay, so all of that. But, and it's a big but you notice, uh, what blockchain can do for you is create provable audit trails. So if I have a transaction that goes through my broker, say, and it's recorded in the blockchain, you know for sure that this account transferred this amount to that other account, it sold something, it bought something, it did it at a specific time. All right, so it's a database that records something with a provable audit trail. If I have, say, a medical device, I know that your heart monitor, I can record that telemetry in the blockchain. And I know that I reacted properly because I say at 4.17 on Monday, there was an anomaly and then I know the nurse or the doctor came at 4.18. All right, so it provides audit trails like that that are immutable and provable and public if you want them to be. Uh, Timestamps, we just said, can't be censored. So if it's important you don't censor things, if you want to make sure that data is out there and doesn't disappear, that's important. Can't be altered. There's no way to rewrite it. It's immutable. Most, very importantly, there's no need for a trusted authority or a data intermediary. So uh, databases, by construction, always have somebody at the center. Maybe it's Amazon, maybe it's Microsoft, maybe it's Bank America, uh, maybe it's FedEx. Those databases are in somebody's control. If I can trust somebody, great, I should use a database. But if I'm not sure I can trust somebody, if I want to be independent of trusting somebody, Blockchain is your guy. Okay, it also facilitates distributed businesses, business processes. Examples are logistics chain, where, for example, uh, uh, a shipment is, is uh, of, of something is produced in Ecuador. It's sent to the docks. It's go through customs. It's loaded onto a ship. It's uh, offloaded to, a, to another uh, dock. It goes through customs. It's offloaded to a truck. It goes to a warehouse. It goes to a store. That's a chain of custody that has many actors who have no particular relation to each other. American Customs has no relationship to the Honduran producer, right? The shipping company has no relationship to the store that sells. So who should have that data? Who should be in control? Not clear where the center is. So a blockchain will allow you to write uh, uh, a chain of custody. I had the bananas and I gave them to you. I accept that I got the bananas and I put them on the boat and so forth. So we can put this data that validates that the system went as we expected, and if it doesn't, we say, well, you lost the bananas, right? They were in your custody and they didn't arrive here, so where's my bananas, All right? So it allows distributed business processes, uh, real estate's another example, um, and finally you can sort a crypto token. Ah, tokens, you say. So what is a token? So a token is just an accounting entry in a ledger. As I say, you know, Fred owns uh, 57 tech tokens. So that's just uh, an address, you know, uh, a person who owns the account or just an account number, and a balance. Uh, they don't have any other presence, no existence. They're created out of thin air. So there are no Bitcoins, really. They're just entries in ledgers. They have no physical presence beyond that. So they exist because we agree they exist. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum, the two most common crypto tokens, um, and all Bitcoins are recorded in the Bitcoin blockchain only. They can't move off the blockchain. There's no way to control them outside the blockchain, and symmetrically, 
The Bitcoin blockchain can't control anything but Bitcoins. I can't put dollars on the, on the Bitcoin blockchain. So it only records entries of account data for Bitcoins. And similarly, Ethereum is the same thing. So it's maybe hard to read. Well, maybe it's not. So this is from Coin, uh, CoinMarketCap, just one of many places. Currently, all cryptocurrencies collectively, if you calculate their price and the number that exist, it's about a third of a trillion dollars worth of market cap for all, of, all cryptocurrencies. Uh, 24 billion trades a day. Bitcoin is about 40% of that. Altogether, there are about 1,600 or so cryptocurrencies of different kinds. Here's an example of the top six token caps. So you see Bitcoin is currently worth about $8,000. Ethereum is close to 500. Bitcoin is, is $133 billion worth of, of uh, value. Okay. Okay, so that's as of yesterday. All right, so cryptocurrencies, it should, I should say, they're a special case of a broader class of things called crypto tokens. So cryptocurrencies are meant only to be this sort of unit of account. They just are a way of keeping track of who has, who has value. Uh, crypto tokens more generally, though, uh, can do lots of things. They can give you, for example, voting rights, or they can give you access to a system, or they can be reward points, or they can give you voting powers. So those are called utility tokens. And there's, you can configure a token to do all kinds of things. Uh, the the uh, cryptocurrency is sort of the, the most uh, simple case, the most derivative case. All right, so here's, I put this slide up because you can see that there are 113 uh, blockchain startups that have more than $100 million of token cap. So it goes pretty deep as well. So how do we think about the value of these tokens? Well, the first thing to understand is that uh, the slide I said I showed talked about token cap, and that is meant to be a metaphor or something similar to the capitalization of a company. Like Amazon is worth $4 trillion or something. All right, so that's the capital value of the stock. Crypto tokens, cryptocurrencies are not stocks. Very important to, to understand that. If you buy a crypto token, a cryptocurrency, you have not bought into the company. You have no rights. You can't vote. You have no share of the profits. Uh, you've just bought into this fictitious accounting thing uh, you have that, that doesn't go beyond that. So they're not an equity in any way. If they were like stocks, we would take the present value of the profits or the dividends we expected to get. Uh, but when you buy a token, you're not getting this. Uh, so if you're going to use the conventional way of valuing equities, uh, valuing stocks, we should say that crypto tokens are worth nothing because they return nothing. Right? They don't give you anything. No rights, no profits. Maybe there's speculative value. So Bitcoin uh, increased in value. So I gave a lecture in Houston in 2017, March. Uh, at that point, Bitcoin was, I think, just about 1,000. And I said, well, I gave this lecture, and I said, you know, I don't think, really, on the whole, it's risky. I don't, I, I don't think you should buy it. And uh, by the end of the year, Bitcoin was worth $20,000. Okay, so listen to this lecture with that context. <laughs> all right, so, all right. Increase in value from uh, 1,200 to uh, 8,000 this year, uh, over this last year, that is to say, back to, uh, to um, um, April 14th or what, 13th uh, of uh, 2017. It's all time high, Bitcoin was $20,000. And uh, well, now it's down to 8,000, so you should buy it, right? Looks like it's doesn't have much value. Um, so a second way of valuing things generally, this is commodities, uh, equities, uh, uh, currencies, anything at all, is called the, the um, efficient market theory. And the idea of efficient market theory is that the best predictor of tomorrow's price is today's price. Okay? And the idea behind it is that if today's price, for example, is lower than tomorrow's expected price, I could buy it today and know I'd make money tomorrow. And if it's, too, it's higher than tomorrow's price, I could sell it short and then make money when the price goes down tomorrow. So if I have any expectation that tomorrow's price is different from today's price, there's an arbitrage. So there's an old joke. 
Burton Miller is walking along the quadrangle with a graduate student, and the student says, look, there's a $5 bill on the ground. And uh, Miller says, no, nah, couldn't be. There was somebody who have already picked it up. So that's the essence of efficient market theory. There are no $5 bills in the ground because otherwise somebody would have already picked them up. Okay, so um, arbitrage profits drives this, and by this measure, anything could be a value of crypto tokens. It's a self-fulfilling prophecy. If we all agree that crypto tokens are worth $10,000, we all pay $10,000. That's rational. You know, if we believe that, it makes sense. So this is just a belief system that can be self-enforcing. So present value says zero. Uh, efficient market theory says anything, right? Anything is a sustainable value. Well, what about monetary theory? So what's the basic economics of money? So what's it good for? Nothing, right? This is money. It's just a piece of paper. Nothing to it, right? Now, why is it that I agree to accept money for doing my work? Well, it's because I believe that I can later on go to 7-Eleven and buy a six-pack, right? Somebody else is going to accept money, all right? So this is a fiat currency. Fiat means let it be, right? Or else it means small Italian car. But it means that it was created from nothing. Right? The federal government said, this is worth $20, and it has some others that it says are worth $50 and $100. They're not materially different. They just have different numbers, right? So um, these are Federal Reserve notes. They have no more intrinsic value than Bitcoin. They're worth $20, and that's worth real stuff because we agree they're worth $20 and are willing to exchange it for real stuff. It's an illusion every bit as much as Bitcoin. What makes them special is the treasury wizards have enchanted them, right? And that's what makes us believe. Okay. So, we take these paper uh, tokens, oops, uh, in exchange for things of real value, because we believe that people in the future are going to do that. And that brings us to sort of the fundamental uh, tenet of monetary theory, which is money is trust. Okay, so we trust that somebody will take it in the future. That's what money is. Without trust, money is paper. All right. I was at Microsoft. Uh, uh, there was a motto they had. It said, uh, uh, Microsoft runs on trust. So by transitivity, I guess they run on money. So certainly true. All right. At a more practical level. All right. So there are three traditional, use, three traditional uses of money, three traditional things we think about money. First, money is a medium of exchange. So it solves the mutual coincidence of wants problem. That's awesome because if I want a six pack and I go to 7-Eleven and I say I'm willing to give you two minutes of an economics lecture, I probably won't get a six pack, right? So I've got to find somebody that wants my lectures. And those students, they give me these fiat currency devices and then I go and I buy my six pack. So without that, I would have no beer. So Yay, money. So it solves that mutual coincidence of wants problems. Second, it's a store of value. I can put these $20 bills under my mattress or I can store them in my bank account as digits. And if it doesn't decrease in value too quickly, it allows me to save some of that value for future uses. So a store of value, I could also store gold or pinto beans or collectible uh, uh, Pez dispensers. All those things could be a store of value. Money has the advantage that it tends to be more liquid and if it's a stable currency, that's something that we can also value. Finally, it's a unit of account. So how do I know the value of an economics lecture versus six pack? Would be a matter of dispute. But if I say there's a price per hour for economics lectures and a price per six pack, and we've agreed on these things through markets, we don't really have to negotiate the relative price of any particular item. We can just take the ratio of the prices. All right, so those are the major purposes of money. So now we get to the quantity theory of money. So this is really, really old. And the quantity theory of money is an accounting identity. So it's not really a, a theory. It's a truth. It's trivial. It has to be true. There's no way it's around it. Now, what it means, we, we can talk about. So here's the quantity theory of money. We have money supply, which is the amount of dollar bills or tokens that are circulated in the market. We have the price of those tokens. What are they valued in dollars? We have the total number of tokens that exist. 
in the case of Bitcoin, is about 17 million. Uh, and then we have the velocity. This is important. How quickly do these tokens move between people? Do they move twice a day, once a day? Do they sit for a month? So the faster they move, the more value they can transact. So the velocity is an endogenous choice by agents in the system. And then we have the dollar value of total transactions traded in a day. And so the quantity theory of money says the total number of tokens transacted in a day has to equal the money supply times the volume. Well, that's trivial, right? If I've got 100 tokens uh, and the velocity is 2, then 200 tokens must transact during the day, right? Trivial. Okay. So why do I care about that? Because more interestingly, I can write these equations. All right, why are those interesting? Right here. So imagine that I wanted to buy and sell goats for some unknown reason. And so I issue a, a goat token on a blockchain. Uh, perhaps I issue 100 of them. Suppose that the velocity of these is twice, is two. So each goat token changes hands twice a day. Also suppose there are 800 goats in total that are transacted during a day. Well then, there are a total of 800 goats transacted, which means it must be the price of the goat token whoop, is four, right? It has to be that if there are 200 transactions of coins a day and 800 goats are transacted, the token has to be worth four goats. It's an accounting identity. Okay, so that's what drives this. All right, so why is it interesting? Well, you can do the math here. I'll get to the bottom line. It turns out the velocity of Bitcoin as of yesterday was 6.6%. So 6.6% transacted during a day, that's endogenous. If people lose confidence, it might transact more quickly. There may be reasons for the currency moving slowly or moving quickly. Uh, but we do the math and we find that everything works out according to the quantity theory of money. All right, so. Oops, that's what I just uh, said, I'm sorry. So 6.6% today, that's what the math works out to. Why do we care about that? Okay, because what drives the value of Bitcoin or any token then is uh, the demand to support a certain number of transactions per day. So if I don't really care to make transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain, if I don't want to buy things or trade them, it has no value, right? So it has to be that people believe that Bitcoin has a value and want to exchange it. So that's number one. Two, uh, the velocity of the tokens depends on technology, people's expectations, people's uh, demand, transactions cost, and finally the number of tokens. So the number of tokens is chosen by the platform. Uh, the demand and the velocity are endogenous to consumer choice. And those can be affected by the rules of the platform. Okay, so we can begin to th think about the value of tokens in this context, looking at the quantity theory of money. Okay, so, so why is Bitcoin so volatile? So Bitcoin has gone up in value 700% this year or so. Uh, 2018, it's gone between a low of 6,000 and a high of 15,000. In 2017, it, was, it varied between $800 and, and $20,000. So that's a huge variation in value. So how can we explain that? Okay, well, um, let's go back to the quantity theory of money. We saw that, that, uh, ex that the uh, um, that, uh, present value implied a zero value for bitcoins. We saw that, that uh, rational expectations, that model, said it could be anything. What about quantity theory of money? Well, suppose that we managed to transact every coin in every block that was written. So this is the maximum theoretical velocity of Bitcoin. That means that since blocks are written every 10 minutes, there's 144 blocks written per day, which means if you do the math, that there are a possibility with 17 million coins of 2.5 billion Bitcoin transactions a day. That's the theoretical maximum number of Bitcoins that can be exchanged during a day. Okay, if for whatever reason we wanted to transact nine billion dollars, which is what we did yesterday, uh, we could support that with a price of three dollars and sixty cents instead of eight thousand. So quantity theory of money says that three dollars and sixty cents is the lower bound. 
but that's only if the velocity is 144 times a day instead of 0.06% a day, right? So why is the velocity low instead of high? Consumer choice. So there's a great deal of volatility because the velocity can vary, right? And there's nothing per se that thins that down. Okay, so the key thing here is that $8,000 is an equilibrium price. $3.60 is the lowest possible equilibrium price. Higher prices could be equilibrium. Anything is possible. So there's really nothing in economic theory that pins down the value of any cryptocurrency. Right? It's inherently whatever we think it is, uh, at least within a great set of bounds. So there's multiple equilibrium, and in fact, an infinite possible number of equilibrium prices. All right, so this is a picture. It's a little bit dated. I haven't had time to update it. But what this shows is uh, the fraction of bitcoins that have exchanged over different periods of time. So for example, the very top part says those are all the bitcoins uh, that haven't traded in five years. They've stayed in the same account, haven't moved. Next uh, three to five years and so on. The bottom are th bitcoins that ex have ex been exchanged in one particular day. So what do we learn from this? Well, we see, number one, about 2% of bitcoins move once a day. So those are actively moving back and forth. Those are sort of real live coins. On the average, bitcoins move about every 80 days or so. Uh, second, 20% have not moved in five years. And about half have not moved in two years. Why is that? Could be people are just holding them as a store of value. But the likelihood is that a great deal of those, especially those that have not moved in five years, have been lost. And how are they lost? If you don't have your private key, if you've lost it, if you've forgotten it, then you cannot access your account. It's like losing your password, and it cannot be recovered. So if I lose that, those coins are sitting there and can never be moved again. They will never move on the Bitcoin blockchain ever, ever, ever. It's as if they were burnt. It's as if those were destroyed. So it's likely that about hmm, something, 40% maybe, of the Bitcoins that exist have been lost. No one has control, and they can never be moved again. So the monetary base might be lower than we think. OK. So this all sounds negative, right? Blockchain is lobotomized database. Bitcoins can have any value at all. Economics doesn't help us assess the value to any great extent. But Bitcoin is, blockchain is awesome. So why is blockchain awesome? Well, the first thing uh, to realize, well, so my prediction is New York Stock Exchange will be on blockchain in five years, if not sooner. First thing to realize, though, is that blockchain and cryptocurrencies, and in particular, blockchain and Bitcoin, are not at all identical. Blockchain is a generalized ledger technology. It's not just for cryptocurrencies. It can do lots and lots of things. It can do certain things very well. It can't do everything databases does, uh, do. So what can blockchain do? One example would be public records. So if, for example, I wanted to, uh, let's say, uh, have my car, my car title on a blockchain, why would I want to do that? Because I could have a, a private key. I can have a copy of my title in the blockchain. It's a public record anyway. It's visible. If I want to sell you the car, I write a transaction saying, here's my public key. Make the transaction go to your account. You own the car. The county clerk signs it with their cryptographic key. So we can decentralize everything. We can have a public record and an easy, low transactions cost way to sell houses, to keep records of titles of cars, to put marriage certificates, birth certificates in an immutable and easily accessible format. All right, so public records. The public has a right to know and wants confidence that things are, are true. Payment systems, Visa, MasterCard. Visa, MasterCard uh, will probably move to the blockchain or be disintermediated. Visa and MasterCard charge about 2.5% uh, as a fee. Blockchain can do things considerably cheaper in a decentralized way. Uh, connected devices, Internet of Things, uh, all your devices that speak to one another, your Nest, your phone, your, uh, your washing machine, uh, your dishwasher, <laughs> it's in love with your stove. They're trading messages, right? So that's a little bit of a concern. But if we had them write their telemetry to a blockchain that we could access, that we could read, we know in real time what it is they're talking about. 
They might even engage in transactions. It might be that maybe my bandwidth is insufficient and so I trade bandwidth with the router across the street or I sell the solar power that's extra <laughs> to my neighbor. So I could have my Internet of Things devices speaking to one another and even engaging in transactions uh, on my behalf as an agent. And that would be recorded in a blockchain because, of course, if it's not, it's just in a database or it's lost. Logistics, I mentioned, two-sided markets, matching problems, squirrels, everything's going to be in blockchain. Okay, so our cryptocurrency is a Ponzi scheme. They have no intrinsic value. Uh, they're only worth what the next person will pay for them. So it's sort of like the greater fool theory, right? If I can find somebody dumber than me to buy it, then I win. If not, I lose. So it sounds like a Ponzi scheme, but not. Really, uh, I think that cryptocurrencies are a bit, uh, if you know what dot-com boom was, uh, it's dot-com 2.0. As I mentioned, Bitcoin and blockchain are not the same. Crypto tokens and cryptocurrencies are not the same. And not all blockchains even need a crypto token or a cryptocurrency to operate. For example, the public records doesn't need it. Um, second, most of the blockchain startups, there are 1,600 that was listed there. Most of them are just about as, as dumb as a post. Just incredibly stupid ideas. No revenue models, just not going to work. And that's what we saw in the dot-com boom. We saw pets.com, webband.com. Business models that could not have possibly worked, and yet the companies were valued at billions. So we, we don't know what's good and what's bad, and there's certainly lots of bad stuff. Um, but for every pets.com, there's going to be a Google somewhere. So in other words, we don't have a clear idea of what blockchain is going to do, just like we did not have a clear idea of what the, the Internet was going to do in 2000 or 1990. It was just not understood uh, what applications it would have and how it would change our life. But it is going to, I think, generate a wave of disintermediation and creative destruction in lots of different places. Uh, if your guess about what is the coming thing is good, you can profit from that. All right, so here's the conclusion. Blockchain certainly is overhyped. Most blockchain uh, startups are badly conceived. Um, almost every major enterprise and every government entity thinks it wants blockchain. Got to have it. Why? No idea at all. What is it? Do you tell me. You know. So there. I know this because there are people that are sitting at Deloitte and Touche or at Microsoft or, and they're repurposed from accounting or engineering. And they say, okay, you're a blockchain guy. <laughs> There's no real information. There's no good way of determining. So that's a, ter that's a terrible job. I feel sorry for those guys. Okay, you could get rich speculating on cryptocurrencies, but it's a matter of timing. You know? And if you have good timing, you can get rich anywhere. So good luck to you. Um, but it's going to be important, and it's going to have lots of values. And so uh, watch it, pay attention, and it's probably worth learning something about. <coughs> And that's it. Thanks for listening. No, certainly was a computer scientist that thought of it, or actually probably a group of them. And uh, the proof of work algorithm is just an awesomely beautiful piece of computer science. It's a cool piece of math. Uh, so it solved a problem of making something provably immutable. So that's a neutral technology. Very cool. Um, why did they need it? Well, the, the, the idea of why we needed this is that it's a currency which is not controlled by a government. So it's something which can give people the possibility of freedom. Something which can, in, a, in an age where everything is recorded in somebody's database, give people an ability to have some autonomy. So they're crypto anarchists. 
that believe that we should not have all of our transactions be known by Visa, MasterCard, or the ACH places. So it's to give autonomy. Um, Bitcoin is not scalable, cannot be a world currency. It just is not, just don't have the infrastructure for it. Neither can Ethereum. Cryptocurrencies could be a world currency, but not the ones we have right now. Criminals, absolutely. There are criminals in part because it's anonymous. Uh, there's lots of people that aren't criminals. In fact, with Ethereum in particular, there's, a, there's lots of people that got into the project early, started about 2013 or so, uh, and they're now rich because they bought Ethereum or they were given Ethereum and it was worth nothing, and now it's worth $500 or something. So I call these guys the crypto riche. So they just made their money because they got their coins early. But uh, cryptocurrency is not really different than cash. I mean, there's cash transactions that are by criminals, and there's lots of money that's laundered th through cash by criminals. This is just something which is a neutral technology that can be used for good or for ill. Is there another question there? Uh, maybe, but I didn't think so. Okay, good. <laughs> I've beaten it out of you. Yes? Why do you think uh, the Bitcoin lost more than half of its value just in the last few months? Well, um, so uh, I always respond when people ask me for advice like that that I'm a theorist and so I know nothing. I really don't know. I mean, it, the, everything's in equilibrium. So you're asking me why was it that expectations suddenly formed, you know, went in that direction? Well, you know, I could, I could say things that financial journalists say, uh, uh, well, there was a SEC regulation that caused market concern or there are alternative technologies. It can, could be anything, but there's nothing provable. It's just for whatever reason, the market decided that it was more risky than it thought previously, and some people exited, and it found a new price. But uh, the people didn't lose co confidence in Bitcoin yet? Or? Well, I mean, it's still worth 8,000. Okay, still, yeah. still confidence. Yeah, I, I actually, I, my personal belief is that Bitcoin will, will last <laughs> a long time. I don't know what its value will be, but even though it's a technology that can't stale, it still has this sort of really interesting anonymity factor, and I think it will have a purpose and probably will live for five years, ten years, who knows. But there's nothing that makes Bitcoin's failure inevitable, in my view. Yes? So, <coughs> in the long term scheme with blockchain, uh, with you talked about like New York Stock Exchange, yep. where does that put the miners? Are they still going to be... Ah. <laughs> okay, so... Miners, it's, it's, uh, this is sort of the uh, essential part of the, of the uh, Nakamoto Protocol, which would take too long to go into, which you can read about it. So miners engage in this, this uh, cryptographic effort. They, they try to solve a cryptographic puzzle. Basically how it works is this. Um, we've got 32,000 miners. Each collects a block of transactions on their own. Uh, they engage in a cryptographic contest where they have to do lots of check and guess. So they check, they, they guess, they check, that was wrong. It's like guessing a random number in some sense. Uh, the only way to solve that cryptographic puzzle is to do trillions and trillions and trillions of calculations. There's no other way. So that's the proof of work. You invested $50,000 of computational effort to find this puzzle solution. So the miners, the lucky miner that finds it, he is given the right to write the next block. He is, he is the one that proposes it. He propagates it through the peer-to-peer -peer network, the gossip network. Everybody appends it to their current blockchain. Uh, and he is rewarded. How is he rewarded? Two ways. First, there's something called a Coinbase transaction, and this is why they're called miners. If I was a lucky guy that solved that cryptographic puzzle, I get to write to myself 12.5 brand new Bitcoins that never existed. So it's as if they were mine. They came from nothing. So the protocol permits me to claim 12.5 brand new Bitcoins if I was one that solved the puzzle. Also, I get the transactions fees people have offered uh, in that blockchain. So um, 12.5, uh, <coughs> and the Bitcoin is currently worth uh, uh, $8,000. So that's on the scale of $100,000 if my math is right, right? Something like that. So $100,000 if you find a block. So that's how much value is created every 10 minutes. That decreases every two years by half, and so in the limit, there'll be 21 million Bitcoins. Okay, so there's inflation, but it's limited inflation. Will there be miners in the future? No, because proof of work is a dead-end technology. 
it just is ultimately unsustainable. And other alternatives, proof of stake, lots of other things uh, will take over. So, but that's fine. We'll uh, the validators will still be paid. They just won't be paid by mining, in my view. It's decentralized. So you could become a miner by setting your computer up, downloading the Bitcoin protocol, communicating with the web, and then if you get lucky, propagating your block. So anyone, anywhere can be a miner. You shouldn't be, by the way, <laughs> because it's not profitable. It, it turns out that most of the miners are in China. Now, why is that? Well, because the major cost of doing Bitcoin mining is electricity. And so where electricity is the cheapest is where you can mine. So if I'm paying six cents a kilowatt hour for electricity and you're paying 22, I should be the miner and you shouldn't, right? Because I'm your... So why are they in China? Why is it that uh, power is cheap in China? Well, it's not really cheap in China, but if I'm a general, it's cheap for me, right? So that's how it, it's, uh, it's, that's why it's done in China. About something more than half are in China. Other questions? I'm sorry, louder. Despite we have more than 1,000 cryptocurrency, why do you think Bitcoin has 40% uh, dominance? Um, well, uh, it was the firstest with the mostest. It's just a question of network externalities. They were there, uh, and um, there's no reason we couldn't tomorrow all go to Stellar. That it, it could absolutely happen, except it won't, because we can't coordinate that way. So nothing is magic about Bitcoin. It's just where we are and where we stay. Anything else? Yes. So Bitcoin will never be a major transactional currency. Uh, the reason is this, that by protocol, Bitcoin cannot make more than seven transactions per second. Visa MasterCard does 56,000, all right? So it just does not have the volume to, uh, to have any kind of scale on the world level. Also, uh, transactions fees are between $4 and $50. You can't buy a pizza if that's what you have to pay for a transaction fee. So it will, not, it will never be the world currency or any kind of thing. It can, change, it can exchange large amounts of value, but never small amounts of value. That's not to say the blockchain couldn't do it. So a new kind of currency absolutely could do that. Um, why, uh, but you're sort of asking about store of value. So it's not necessarily true that it's not a good store of value. It's just highly volatile, right? Sometimes it goes up, all right? So it's just not stable. And so the question might be, how do you create a stable coin? And that's, that's uh, people have tried to do this. It's actually the same issue that uh, comes up when you try to uh, peg a currency against another currency. So if I want the value of the euro to always be $1.25, pegging that, making that fixed, means I have to back that up with my own currency reserves. So it turns out basically not to be possible, except in one extreme case where you, every dollar you take in, you use to back the currency so people can sell it for a dollar. So it's gotta be 100% backed uh, to have a stable coin. Uh, because Ripple is a currency that exists on a permissioned blockchain, not a public blockchain. So a, a permissioned blockchain means that only if I have, a, I'm trusted, I'm a bank, I'm Deutsche Bank, I'm Bank America, only they have access to the Ripple blockchain and they make exchanges. Um, so actually, Ripple is a brilliant idea. It's not a new idea, but it's a brilliant idea. The idea is this. Um, Suppose that we're engaging in, in wires back and forth. You've got somebody who lives in Italy, you want to give them $50. You've got somebody that lives in Cambodia, you want to give them $100. It costs about $35 and takes 10 days to make that transfer. So instead what we could do is Deutsche Bank and Bank America, all kinds of wires go back and forth. You know? So I make 2,000 wires to Deutsche Bank totaling $5 million, costing $50 each. Deutsche Bank makes uh, 8,000, totaling $8 million or something. 
there's no reason we should make all those individual transfers. Instead, let's just keep a record of them in our permissioned private blockchain that nobody can read because it's encrypted. And then, at the end, well, I, I, tr I trust Deutsche Bank for $3 million. But if it gets to be 25, make a once and for all transaction, all right, and then we'll settle. So that's an old idea. It comes from the Chinese invented it, the Arabs invented it. Uh, it's a very old idea to that kind, do that kind of settlements. Uh, Ripple does it, and the Ripple currency itself is a way to create markets where markets don't exist. Mm -hmm. So if I happen to want to exchange uh, Cambodian currency for Botswana currency, that market is really thin. There's no people drew in that sort of exchange. So I can sell uh, one currency for Ripple, and somebody is a market maker that goes and finds Botswana currency, and so it's a, it's a lubricant for the market. Okay, but it's meant to be a private currency. You can't own, well, you can own Ripple, but you can't use Ripple. Anything else? Yes. Because you know too much power, Bitcoin consumes too much uh, power uh, for mining. Well, uh, <coughs> so I would say that it's, it's, it has to be less efficient. The economics tells us it must be less efficient because, uh, although it's a little bit different. The empirical fact is this, <laughs> that Bitcoin transactions, one Bitcoin transaction costs at least $4. But on the other hand, it doesn't cost a percentage. If you make a $1,000 Visa transaction, it's $25 because it's 2.5%, right? So why is Visa 2.5%? Because Visa has to worry about fraud. So part of those transactions, actually, they have to make good because they are fraudulent transactions. So even though they charge 2.5%, they're providing insurance services. And so at the end, they might only make half a percent or 0.75%, depending upon how good their fraud detection is. Bitcoin doesn't have to worry about fraud because once it's written, it's written and that's it, all right? So it's a higher fixed cost. There's no percentage cost. The models are different because they're doing different types of things. Uh, there's no reason that cryptocurrencies need to cost that much. But if you do proof of work, they will. That's why I say proof of work is a dead end. Anything else? Okay, thanks very much. Thank